Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. This week, we dive back into the world of entrepreneurship and examine the interplay between disruptive new ideas and backlash from threatened incumbents. In the second half of our show, Jared Meyer from the Manhattan Institute joins us to talk about New York Mayor Bill de Blasio's war with Uber. Up first, we welcome Evan Baer, co-founder and co-CEO of Able, a startup online lender to small businesses. Evan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bill. Evan, I asked you on to talk about your new collaborative lending startup, Able, but before we do, let's back up a bit. You came by this business via a very circuitous path, thanks to some unusual decisions by your lead venture capital investor, Peter Thiel. Tell us the outbox story. Well, it began about six years ago. A good friend of mine and I were just finishing up at business school at Harvard, Mm -hmm. and we had studied with Christensen there, the famous author of The Innovator's Dilemma and Innovator's Solution, who really began the whole research arena in introducing into our common nomenclature this idea of disruptive innovation. Sadly, today, when most people say disruption, they mean we'll go mess with it. Uh, (laughs) But we really took it literally. And so we thought about how could we apply this profound theory about how new businesses are created and can disrupt incumbents to a government agency. Uh, we were both free market people. We loved the idea of championing private industry. Mm-hmm. And in our crosshairs was the Postal Service, which actually came out of a very personal experience for both of us, which was that we had moved frequently every you know nine or 12 mm-hmm. months between mm-hmm. apartments and between cities. And uh, soon enough, you have 10 previous addresses where your parking tickets and insurance notifications, <laughs> et cetera, are going to. And it's just a horrible user experience. So we set out to create this alternative. My horrible user experience is every day I go down to my box at the condo, I open it up, and it's stuffed with so much junk, I can't find the mail I actually want. Yeah, it's exactly right. Most people get uh, five to eight pieces of junk mail per day. And it's a strange marketing channel where there's a funny Seinfeld episode which gets to this, which is um, he goes to attempt to cancel his mail service and gets arrested by the U.S. Postmaster (laughs) General, which they actually employ 6,000 people as part of the postal yeah. police. So it's not, not out of the question. So how did Outbox work? The premise of Outbox was it was a consumer internet service. And when you sign up for Outbox, our promise to you was that you never go to your mailbox again. Mm-hmm. Sign up for our service. And then the next day, all the mail that was going to come to your house or apartment would instead show up on your phone. Fully scanned, searchable, exportable, the Evernote, Dropbox, searchable. And you could even say... I want you to shred this physically. I want you to deliver this to my house. Mm -hmm. I want you to deliver it to my accountant. It was sort of like Google Voice, but for your postal mail. And an overlay on top of the post office. Didn't replace it. You still need the post office. Exactly right. Postal Service does the original movement from the sender of mail to uh, the last mile, the DDU, which is kind of like your local Mm -hmm. postal service. And that's actually where we intercepted the mail and then ran it through a bunch of machines we built to create the digital replicas. So they welcomed you with open arms, huh? Early on, we had great reception. We had some conversations with uh, regional vice presidents of the Postal Service who were interested in championing these pilot projects for innovation. Uh, They clearly knew there was consumer Mm -hmm. interest there. So early on, this got us this pilot in which the Postal Service said, thumbs up, give this a try, and let us know how it goes. Wow. And, And what happened next? Well... Sadly, we had some great things happen, which was that customers were loving the service. We were launched in uh, Austin, Texas. Our Mm -hmm. second market was San Francisco. And as we're scaling, we're getting a bunch of PR, which people like to tell the story of how outdated the Postal Service was in that quarter. I think they lost something like $18 billion. So (laughs) the stories were pretty rough on the Postal Service. So we get a call from the United States Postmaster General's office. He's literally a general. Mm -hmm. The general at the time was uh, Pat Donahoe. He had been born and raised as a letter carrier himself. His father was a letter carrier. He had worked his way up. And he says, his team says, we need to see you guys in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. So Will, my co-founder and I put on our suits and ties, go to Washington, D.C. We had both been fairly familiar with Capitol Hill. We had worked there for a few years right. and knew some of the basics. But this experience was a new low <laughs> for us in a lot of ways. We go to the headquarters of the Postal Service, which is in L'Enfant Plaza, which has an aptly fake pseudo Louvre-like museum, which clearly suggests their ability to sort of be an imposter and and, and a silly (laughs) excuse for a technology company. Anyway, so we get into the building, and uh, on the very first floor 
is a model of the new Interceptor, which is the flagship vehicle of the Postal Police. Mm -hmm. So we're like, this is a serious thing. We get in the elevator, go up to the sixth floor, to the senior suite to meet with the Postmaster General and the full leadership team. It's a general counsel, head of operations, head of digital innovation, the whole team. So we're in there. We're in a windowless conference room with giant sticky notes on the wall and just a really – you felt like – you were in like the HR department of Ford or something. It was just, it was rough. So he says, all right, well, tell me about what you guys are working on. So we run through the pitch saying things like, we want to help bring the postal service into the 21st century. Right. We want to create this niche experience for digital natives. We want to work with you in sharing data and finding creative partnerships to help you guys innovate this new product. And uh, we go around the horn and get feedback from different members of the executive team. First, the head of legal officer says, well, this is clearly illegal. There's no way you can do this. And we said, well, it's actually the former GC of the Postal Service that actually wrote all of our agreements, so we're pretty sure it's legal. Head of operations says, look, there's no way this will operationally work. It just can't be done. We said, well, we're currently running in uh, six DDUs operationally right now, so it, it probably at least could possibly work. Then we get the two best lines of the whole meeting. First is head of digital innovation who, as a side note, was in his 60s, used BlackBerry, and most recently his job was he ran the union of unions of letter carriers, like the the Uber union. The Uber union, well. And so he's now the head of digital innovation, and he looks at us and he says, guys, here's the problem. No one will use it. Digital is a fad. It could (laughs) only work in Europe. (laughs) So we kind of knew the meeting was off to a bad start Mm -hmm. with that line, and then that was just kind of a silly line. We then get to the postmaster general, who's a smart man, Mm -hmm. runs a 600,000-person organization, largest civilian vehicle fleet in the world of 250,000 vehicles. It's a really big, complicated entity that has a a strange and complex management structure. And his response was very instructive to us. He said, well, the problem is that the customer that you're talking about, and here we were thinking about the receiver of mail, the U.S. citizen whose taxpayer money is funding the Postal Service, et cetera. He says, that's actually not our customer. Our customer is the sender of mail. It's about 400 volume mailers. And our product to them is a guaranteed delivery of their junk mail onto your kitchen table. Oops. So you found out that the American citizen is not the customer, it's the product, and we're being sold to the junk mailers. There's a great line. It's something like, if the product is free, then you are it. (laughs) Yeah, well... So you're done. Now you're toast. You walk out of there, you're finished. What'd you do? Well, we, with our board, Peter Thiel and Mike Maples are Mm -hmm. are great supporters of ours. We brainstormed this crazy alternative model to attempting last mile interception of postal mail. So we really tried this uh, insane model. We said, okay, look, we've been shut down by the postal service. Let's try it a different way. So we try that model. We built fleets of hybrid Toyota Priuses driving around neighborhoods, and Uh, we had this model where you could send in a picture of your mailbox key on your iPhone, uh, and we'd use laser technology to recognize the pattern and print (laughs) our own version of your key. They let you do that? (laughs) They did. It's actually completely legal. We had it all approved. Not that if it were illegal, they would have moved fast Mm -hmm. enough to prosecute us, but it's kind of beside the point. So we uh, try this crazy alternative model, and in the end, just sort of the model was collapsing under just wild costs, sure. which we had modeled, but the costs were higher than we thought. The acquisition costs were higher than we thought. And you put those things together. And despite our most valiant attempts to run around the federal government, we weren't able to do it successfully and really concluded here that, you know, you can outcompete a competitor. You can probably outmaneuver the government or your regulator. But when the regulator is your competitor, it's really impossible to be victorious. And so you did something unusual. You offer your investors the balance of their money back. We reached this tough decision where we said the data we have has persuaded us to lose confidence in how we're spending money in building this business, and we want to shut down this product. Mm -hmm. And we go to our investors with that news, prepared to give all the money back. Mm -hmm. And our investors, you know, looked directly at us and they said, you guys have built an extraordinary team, and it's the team and you guys that we put this money into. So take this money and go build something awesome. I guess that's why they call a founder's fund, huh? Yeah. 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 Well, Mike Mables and Peter Thiel are massively founder-friendly 
investors. This is peculiar to many people new to venture capital investing, but Mm. particularly at the seed level and even sometimes in the A, these early investment rounds, the investors are putting money into the people and into the team, almost with the known reality that the business model will totally change if the company is successful. And it did. You pivoted to Able. It was the pivot of all pivots. We had this bizarre situation of three and a half million dollars and an excellent team that we loved and tabula rasa to build whatever we want. So we went into this crazy 12-week process of thinking through all of our lessons from Outbox. We documented literally over 100 lessons about how the team works and what mm-hmm. customers want, et cetera. We thought about what Mike Mables calls megatrends, sort of sociological trends that are new and create likely future pockets for customer demand. And then we spent a lot of time with customers in the community. And it was at this intersection through this 12-week process of building and shipping minimal viable products that we put two things together. The first was many of our friends Mm -hmm. and neighbors in Austin, Texas were building small businesses, Mm -hmm. not tech startups, but real companies, bakeries, laundromats, restaurants, t-shirt companies, Mm -hmm. et cetera. And these are companies that we really came to learn that 25 years ago would have been funded by a bank, sure, but now cannot gain credit from a bank. And we kind of dove into that and learned about a massive amount of federal government regulation in the last 15 years that literally prohibits banks from making loans to the category of small businesses that produces 70% of all jobs in the country and employs 51% of the workforce. And that's broadly described as small businesses. So number one, small business owners that were excellent couldn't access credit. Number two, the megatrend. What was the megatrend? The sharing economy. It's almost trite now. Everyone's talking about Mm -hmm. it. But as you dive into what does the sharing economy mean, it's very interesting. There's a Harvard economist named Yokai Bankler who writes a wonderful book called The Wealth of Networks. And in it, he distinguishes between two types of uh, sharing. There's collaborative consumption, collaborative production. We dove into this academic work and came up with a strategy to apply this broad movement that people know powers things like Airbnb Mm -hmm. and Uber Mm -hmm. and applied it to the market of how do we fund small businesses that we love. So, Evan, describe the structure of what you call a collaborative loan. What was critical for us was finding a way to fund a small business that had revenues, was profitable, Mm -hmm. and was growing, and the bank said no to. One of our favorite early customers is a great story, a guy named Josh Hare. Uh, Josh runs a brewery. He's got a great story. He was at Abilene Christian University, which is a dry campus. <laughs> the only way he was able to have alcohol on his campus was he learned that if you buy the component parts of alcohol, and make you can make beer. beer and drink it. <laughs> so entrepreneurs are very creative people, and he surely was. So he's had a passion for brewing beer mm-hmm. and created a brand called Hops and Grain here in Austin, Texas, a brewery that makes several different types of beer. And the company was doing really well. He had been funded originally from some friends and family, chipping in money to buy the basics for his brewery. And then he believed that the right thing to do was to go to a bank. So he put on a dress shirt, brought in his financials, and went in and sat across from a banker who, after he explained his story, uh, literally said, we'd love to fund you, but there's just absolutely no way that you qualify for a loan. And this is a guy that's got revenues, he's got profit, he's building a great business. So those are exactly the kinds of people that we want to fund since Dodd-Frank, everything's turned against Main Street. We've heard that Citibank itself has tripled its funding of compliance officers at the company, which has led to, at the branch level, real suffocation for small business lenders. Uh, These banks would love to make these loans. They're profitable loans. Mm -hmm. But literally, the feds are saying to a for-profit private company, you cannot make this loan. And the loan is not going to fund a house that's underwater. The loan's going to a profitable business. So it's into this environment that we said, we need to create a different kind of loan that lets us fund these businesses. So what we built was what we believed to be the world's first collaborative loan. So Mm -hmm. the way it works is Josh, in this example, would come to us and say, hey, I need $100,000 to buy this new tank to expand my brewery. Mm -hmm. We would underwrite him. We'd look at his business financials and look at his sources of income, how the business was performing, et cetera. And then we say, we'll give you $100,000 at... 8%. Mm -hmm. And the last piece, which is the novel piece, is that we require Josh raise 25% of the capital to fund his loan from three to five people we call his backers. 
So what Josh does, he reaches out to some customers, an advisor, a family member, and says, Mm -hmm. I've been pre-qualified for this low-interest loan. Will you be a part of making this possible? And then he uses our platform to recruit those people, to then fund the loan, and then service all the payments and communications back to these backers. So it's a really neat way to both, number one, Josh gets funded with us where with the bank he can't get funded. But number two, it really gets back to this sort of historic idea, credit originally from the Latin word credere, which means believe. Loans were not underwritten before the internet between strangers. Mm -hmm. It was always the case that the banker Mm -hmm. knew the borrower. And what the internet does, which is great in a lot of ways, is it gives us a lot of data, but it means that the people that are underwriting the loans have no relationship to the borrower. So we are both forward-looking because we're using technology to create all these relationships and fund loans, but we're also backward-looking to how loans used to be underwritten within communities. And meanwhile, his friends and backers make a good 8%, which they're certainly not going to make depositing it in the bank account. Right, right, right. It provides a return to them. And what we found really cool is that one of his backers is an aunt who has been invited in this really neat way into his business. So she gets updates on how the business is going. Mm -hmm. She shows up and can talk to the employees. And we really believe that small businesses are, and small business owners are the heroes of the American story. And the way, uh, from a long-term ideological perspective, the more individuals in America that have some direct relationship with a small business owner, and in this case, as a small part lender to Mm -hmm. these businesses, more people understand the challenges of businesses and the opportunity of free enterprise. And from a purely practical perspective, it's nice to know that if he stiffs you, he stiffs his friends and neighbors too, and they're not going to be happy about it. Yeah, at the end of the day, we are a for-profit company, and critical to the loans that we fund is that we get repaid, and then we have very low default rates. Mm -hmm. And so by pulling family and friends into the deal, it means that the business owner is less likely to default, both possibly because they're afraid of defaulting on their friends and family, but also maybe more importantly, because they have this core set of people who are there to help them Mm -hmm. in actually making the business successful in the first place. In a positive way. So you recently raised $6 million in Series A venture capital to grow your firm with ambitions to lend out $100 million. Where does the actual loan capital come from? We have arrangements with institutional investment funds that buy these loans from us. So there's real appetite among institutional funds right now for getting access to small business paper, and we are a unique origination source for them. So it's not venture capital investors, but specialty hedge funds that are buying these kinds of assets. Now, are you securitizing these in baskets or are you selling individual loans to third parties? These are individual loans. So we have no securitization right now, which was critical for our legal and regulatory strategy. Mm -hmm. Lending Club is doing off-the-shelf securitization filings for all their loans, in part because they'll take a $15,000 loan and slice it up into a thousand pieces. Mm -hmm. Because we only have up to five backers, we actually create promissory notes which enables us to not have to securitize. So many people find this a dull subject, but the point is Dodd-Frank and securitization laws has a massive chilling effect to innovation in the space. Right, right. And since you don't take customer deposits like a bank does, you're not subject to many banking regulations. Correct. So the folks who are actually taking the back-end risk are sophisticated hedge funds. It's not mom-and-pop depositors, and you haven't securitized these out the way they did the mortgage-backed securities. Correct. So far, Abel's off to a great start, but as you grow, are you worried that regulators are going to take notice and find a way to shut you down the way the post office did? Well, currently, our industry is actually not that regulated. Our space of being a commercial lender, we always lend below the state usury laws, so Mm -hmm. currently, it's a pretty light regulatory structure. What we, though, are very afraid of is what regulation will come down the pike. And actually, the government itself, through the SBA, finds that the number one thing that small business owners say they fear is uncertainty about future regulation. Mm -hmm. More than access to capital, more than finding customers, more than hiring, more than anything else. What's fascinating about that to me is that it's not actually that it's the government regulation itself that concerns them. It's the uncertainty about what the government will do in the future. And that has a huge chilling effect. They don't know when the next shoe is going to drop. Exactly. And so that causes people to, in, a, in facing uncertainty, people choose to not act. They choose to not hire, to not grow, to not raise capital. And regulators are largely oblivious to that. So from our perspective, we are working in a fairly unregulated space, but are very nervous about what will come down the pike in the future. 
early on, we were testing actually some consumer models and heard this wild story about a company called Zest. Zest was started by the chief information officer at Google, Mm -hmm. and he started it out of a passion when he learned that his sister had taken on a payday loan, which had an effective interest rate of 300%. So they start this company to tackle what is a atrocity that people actually get this loan. They build an amazing team. They ship this amazing product. And the CFPB... The new Consumer Protection Financial Bureau. ...comes in and sends them a letter which says, we're very nervous about what you're doing. And at the time, I think their average rate was like in the 50% interest. Mm -hmm. So literally Mm -hmm. one-sixth of what the market rate was for these types of loans. But above the usury laws... Right. But they were doing it legally through interstate commerce. Mm -hmm. So what they were doing was 100% legal, 100% legal and a massive improvement on the market. Mm -hmm. So they get this letter from the CFPB, which says, we don't like what you're doing. And they write back and they say, well, I'm sorry, you don't like it, but here's all the reasons we comply. The CFPB sends a letter to the SEC saying, hey, SEC, we don't like what this company is doing. The SEC, in their review of the banks that enabled Zest to even work, Mm -hmm. They send the banks a letter. The banks shut them down. Yeah. Yeah, they can shut off the spigot from further upstream. So we have this situation where these heroes of innovation, 23andMe or Bitcoin companies Mm -hmm. or drone companies, these are heroes who are trying to build goods and services that delight customers and just literally transform lives. We have regulators who have the ability to, through political power, to shut these companies down overnight, and literally, in some of these cases, actually send these founders to prison. So on the one hand, I'm very encouraged about the future of our economy in the country because we have more people that want to start businesses that can dramatically change lives. At the same time, I'm very concerned because of regulatory capture and the ability for, in particular, the federal government to, on a whim, through the exercise of its power, shut these companies down. Evan, I can hear your enthusiasm just, just coming through the phone. I, I wish you the best of luck with ABLE. It really does sound like an innovative way to get money back into small businesses in this country. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Bill. That was Evan Baer from ABLE here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. You can check out Real Clear Radio on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Real Clear Frezza. And stop by RealClearMarkets.com, my go-to place for diverse views on political economics. Real Clear Radio Hours are not-for-profit, donor-supported program. Please stop by RealClearRadio.org and hit the Donate button or contact us to become a corporate supporter. Ahead, Jared Meyer from the Manhattan Institute brings us up to date on the Uber Wars. Stay tuned.